special welcome to those that have joined us for the Restore Conference this weekend. Yeah, go ahead and give them applause. We're so happy to have you here. We just want to let you know that we hope, our hope and our prayer, not only tonight, but throughout the whole weekend, is that you are refreshed, that your heart is watered, that you connect with Jesus. Um, we are just so honored to be leading you into worship. We have a lot in store this evening. So if you go ahead and stand with me. We also have our, uh, our special guest, Evan Wickham, tonight. Aren't you excited about that? Yeah, I'm sure that'll be really special. So we just have a lot, a lot to experience tonight, and we couldn't be happier to be with you. But let's go ahead and open the evening with uh, some prayer. God, we are just so excited to meet with you tonight. We could be doing anything else, but, but God, we get to come, and we get to come and worship you, Lord. Thank you for that. I pray that your presence would fill this place, Lord. I thank you for, for every person that's in this room. I ask that, Lord, you would just call each and every one of us by name tonight, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't leave here without hearing from you, without meeting with you tonight, Lord. So we do, we welcome you into this place, and we hope and we pray that our worship will just bring glory to your name, Lord. God, we love you so much in your precious name. Amen.
set and um, kind of like I said earlier our hope and our prayer is that that you would be refreshed this weekend and and the closing part of this song it says our hope is in you and I know that life gets crazy and especially for those of us that are in ministry that are visiting here this weekend sometimes we just need that little extra umph to kind of push us through so um, so as we're closing out just this portion of the night um, I want to really want to encourage you just to really truly believe those words that we're singing. Our hope is in Christ. And I love that. Our hope is in him. He is coming back for us, church. (laughs) Yes, that is worth laughing about. He's coming back for us and he so loves to hear the praises of his people. So let's praise him tonight. Yeah. 
second and lead us in some more singing of praises of God. I'm sure you're going to want to stand at that time. Brenton asked me if I would share a little bit tonight. He put an emphasis on a little bit. So I'll try. I wanted to read this little story to you from 2 Kings chapter 6 out of the out of the life of one of the more significant prophets in Israel's history, a prophet named Elisha. He had a school that he developed where he was raising up new prophets for Israel, teaching them, instructing them. And it says in 2 Kings chapter 6, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And Elisha answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So very simple. They realize that they need more room. So they say, can we go out to such and such a place and build more lodging? And he said, go. And they said, we want you to go with us. And he says, okay, I'll go with you. So he went with them, verse 4. And when they came to the Jordan, that's the Jordan River, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God, this is Elisha, said, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So the man reached out his hand and took it. There are three things that I want to say from this very unique story in the Old Testament. Number one, just quite simply, it's probably there right on the surface for all of us to see. Here is this prophet. He looks at one of his pupils, his students, and he says, hey, uh, where did you put in or where did the axe head fall in? You said that you lost it. You said it fell into the water. The guy's all stressed because it was borrowed. And he says, where did it fall in? And he says, over here. And so he puts in a stick and the iron head begins to float. That's not normal, right? And probably the easy thing for us to see there is something very simple. The God who designed the laws of nature to dictate that the iron normally would sink is the God who can break his own rules and cause the iron to begin to float. And I know for me, that's been a, just a meditation in my own heart, just considering the power of God. There are so many things that I look at and I say, these are obstacles, these are rules that seemingly are set in stone, the laws of nature. This is how it must be. The resources aren't enough. The volunteers aren't enough. The energy is not enough. The wisdom is not enough. But then there's this God who can come along and say, yeah, maybe on a normal day, but I'm here. I'm here. And there's a strength and a power of God that I think is there for us. The second thing that I wanted to point out, just considering the power of God toward these people and the power of God toward us is to consider what is it that allows God to release his beautiful, wonderful, majestic power upon our lives. It's foreshadowed in the story. It's hinted at in the text. Elisha takes a stick of wood. He says, where did it fall in? Take me to the place that the bad thing happened. And he puts in the wood and the bad thing is reversed. We know that the Bible is the testimony of Jesus, that there's a testifying of the work of the cross of Christ. Can't you see it there? The picture, where did the bad thing happen? The bad thing happened when we fell into sin and sin destroyed and corrupted the planet and entered, and entered in death and decay and trial and sickness and shame and pain. God says, where did the bad thing happen? There on earth. And the wood, the stick, the cross of Christ. The 
cross. You see, God might create laws of nature, but there are some laws that God is bound by, the laws of his own nature. He is just, he is holy, he is righteous, he is good. He cannot look upon sin and just say, oh, forget about it. No, he has to obey the identity of his own self. So how could God release his blessings upon us by sending his own son, by cursing him, by allowing him to experience the wrath in his own body upon that tree so that the thing that was totally impossible for God to pour out his love upon us is now possible because the stick of the cross of Christ has gone into our situation and we can now be made alive in God, alive in Christ. Isn't that good and sweet to see tonight? The last thing that I wanted to say to you before we sing to the Lord, and part of the reason why I'm sharing this with you tonight is because I just so hope and pray that as we're singing, we are singing because we realize the beauty of the cross of Christ and the love of God, that what we're doing is a response to what we've seen in Jesus. And so the last thing I wanted to say to you is that Elisha looked at this prophet as the iron head is floating there. It's almost funny to me to see it. He says to the young guy, he says, take it up. It's funny to me that he had to say that. You know, there it is, this iron ax head floating in the water. I just imagine this guy looking at it like, that's really weird. I'm watching a miracle unfolding in front of my eyes. And instead of reacting by sticking his hand out, he had to be instructed. Put your hand out. Pick it up. Pick it up. We want to see the Lord work powerfully in our lives. Go to the place that God has worked wonderfully, the cross of Christ. Receive him if you've never received him. Believe in him if you've never believed in him. But go back to that place. That's where his power is released. That's where his grace is released. That's where all the confusion of life can begin to make a little bit of sense when you go back to that place. You have to pick it up sometimes, though, don't you? You have to apply it. Oh, that's what he did. There's the miracle that he performed. There's the wonderful thing that he did. I got to go back to the cross of Christ. Your baby wakes up in the middle of the night for the 187th night in a row. And you have to go back to the cross of Christ and think about the suffering that he endured, the pain and the agony that he endured in order to bring life into this world and, and into this planet. And that you're maybe tasting a little bit of the fellowship of the sufferings of, of, of Jesus. You have sickness that comes into your body that doctors look at you and say, there's nothing we can do about this sickness. And yes, you'll pray that God will touch your body and that he'll heal you on this side of eternity. But you go back to the cross of Christ and you remember that part of what Jesus was doing on the cross when he died upon the cross is he was making a way for us to be healed forever in eternity with him and banishing sickness and death and all of that from this planet. You go through some kind of betrayal, some kind of trial in life, and you can go back to the cross of Christ and say, Lord, you suffered more than I will ever suffer. You were sinless and innocent, and I am not. You see, the cross of Christ puts so many things into perspective. You feel lonely. And you go to the cross of Christ and you see the loneliest instant in any human life in all of history when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cross of Christ, sometimes we have to go back and take it up, amen. So let's in our minds and in our hearts take it up and sing to him for what he's done for us. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Evan. It's rad to worship with you. Of course. Let's do it. It's a joy. Let's give it up for the keyboard guy. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never cease 
that line in the second verse, here I raise my Ebenezer. It's been a while since we've read A Christmas Carol, but uh, Ebenezer means a stone of help. It's a stone of help. Uh, The Jews back in the day would pile rocks on top of each other right where God did something massive. And so the kids would walk by and go, Dad, what's that? And he'd then proceed to tell the story of what God has done. So it's a human building that testifies to God's acting in space and time on behalf of his people. Uh, So if God has acted on your behalf, if God has saved your soul, if God has uh, healed you of anything, uh, if he's taken you from point A to point B, then uh, may we sing that, that second verse, make it the last verse. It ends with God's interposed blood. He has sent his own son to shed blood so that this act of God might be true on our behalf. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when He to rescue, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his prayer. He to rescue, he to rescue me from danger. Let our 
Fill this place, fill our hearts, fill your church. May we see ourselves as members of your body that you are knitting together. You are, you are fashioning a, a fresh temple. You've been fashioning your house since Pentecost, since the Holy Spirit first fell. You've been bringing together your body brick by brick, stone by stone, uh, woman by man, man by woman. You've been bringing us together and inhabiting a temple made of people bought by your blood. So Holy Spirit, would you fall? Would the fire of heaven be made known?
to seek, to thirst. Awaken first love. Come awake and do as you did. on me come wake me from my sleep blow through the caverns of my soul pour in me to overflow Deliver us, deliver, deliver, sing it. 
invited guests, we're his children, we're his bride, all of those things and more. So go ahead and sing your own song in his presence. behind you. May they be uh, us deciding, us deciding to get behind your movements, us deciding to look at all that you do and say, yes, that's what we want to do. Yes, that's what we want to get behind. Um, By the power of your Holy Spirit and by your grace, we're invited into it. So yes, amen, we enter. We enter into your good work of being compassionate and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. Amen to that. We enter into your work of forgiving our enemies, loving our neighbor, and let us not be caught asking who is my neighbor. Loving our neighbor. Amen. We amen you, Lord. You are the eternally existent one. You've always been the first crack of the Bible in the beginning. You're already active. You're already fully present. To the almighty, immortal, invisible God who alone is wise, be glory and honor, dominion and power forever. Amen. So there are musicians here. There are people who understand theory, chords, intervals, first, thirds, fifths, maybe even major seventh. So if that's you, can we sing amen as spread out as we can? Uh, just to amen the presence of God and what he's doing in the world in song. Worship is three-dimensional. We often mistake it for a one-dimensional act of singing and gather church two hours a week when there's another 166 hours a week that God desires our worship. So um, this first dimension, declaring who he is, declaring what he's done, we can enter into this. The other dimensions, living out who he is as his followers. And then the third dimension, living alongside him, with him, him in us, us in him, this participation in the divine life that is a mystery that the Apostle John kind of starts scratching the surface throughout his books at this union, this mystical union between us and God. 
without any of those dimensions, you have a flat, non-existent worship. But we can fully enter into this one. So full harmonies if you know how. Amen. sound beautiful. I like this keyboard. <laughs> it's my first time in the city of Monterey, ever. It's pretty nice. Thank you. It's a beautiful place. You have dunes that have plants on them, which is crazy. Um, yeah, so my wife and I live in Portland, Oregon. We've been there for almost two and a half years, and we have five kids. We have uh, three boys, 10, 10, uh, 13, 10, 7, and then a girl who's two, and then a boy who's five months old. And uh, he's awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. He's nice. He, th he thanks you for that. I don't know what that was, the uh, awe, the cute factor. But, um, yeah, he's really cute. He's our only blue-eyed kid. Um, yeah, uh, we we are pastor, helping pastor a church, leading the worship ministry, and also serving uh, in the leadership at a church in southwest Portland where uh, people are following Jesus in one of the most liberal places in the world. And uh, and th this, whole, this whole coast, really, the west coast, and proximity to San Francisco that you guys are, and Santa Cruz, and all that. There's a lot of, a lot of that, and... Um, the lordship of Jesus extends uh, into the into Portland. Jesus is Jesus is Lord of uh, Jesus is Lord of the homeless. He's the Lord of uh, every community within the city limits. He's the Lord of uh, North Korea. His, his reign is uh, his reign is unstoppable. And one day Jesus' prayer will be realized in full, and the kingdom of God will come on earth as it is in heaven. And but but it's but it's also coming through Jesus' ambassadors, through the ambassadors of the kingdom, who are kind of like dual citizens. It needs a little more nuance there. But we are. We're citizens of America, most of us in this room, I assume. And if you follow Jesus, you're citizens of a heavenly country, the only one that won't fade. And so we sing the anthems. We kind of like, when we write songs, like Dania, right? Dan Dania. When Dania writes a song, she is laying down a little bit more soundtrack to the progression of the kingdom on earth. This is the soundtrack to God's activity in the world. Uh, that's what worship songs, song worship is. I, I like the metaphor from my friend Nick Drake, who, who uh, is planting a church with Tim Hughes in uh, Birmingham, uh, 
not Alabama, but the, the or first Birmingham, the one in England. Uh, they're planning a church called Gas Street Church. It's this old building that used to be uh, the powerhouse for the city back when electricity was first created. Um, discovered, I guess. God made it, but... Um, and this gas street, this it gassed the city. It powered the city with fuel. And uh, so that's kind of their, their big vision statement, their metaphor. We're gas street church, empowering the city with the love of Jesus and filling the city with the presence and electricity of a spirit and um, sh- showing, the, showing the giant, the second largest city in the entire UK, showing this giant populace of mostly, there's, so many, there's three languages spoken in Birmingham that aren't spoken in anywhere else in, the, in all of Europe. They're indigenous to like some far off place and uh, they're only spoken in that city in all of Europe. So it's very, very eclectic and my friend Nick has this metaphor for, for sung worship. It's, uh, you know, rugby. <laughs> it's like when you watch your team like gaining in a 70,000 seat Wembley Stadium and your team is like gaining in blood and sweat. And, uh, there's actually a song that they sing. They have songs for everything. It's not just like cheering. They have songs. And uh, <laughs> they'll sing when their team's taking ground. And then when the opposing team starts to take their ground back, the opposing fans sing, we don't hear you singing. We don't hear you singing. We don't hear you singing anymore. Uh. <laughs> it's a song. They, they all sing it. The song is the soundtrack for the advancement of the team, and that's actually quite a legit metaphor for what we're doing when we sing. Uh, we're like, oh my gosh, Jesus is still plundering Satan's stuff. So like we can sing, when we sing praise God from whom all blessings flow, all creatures here below, all heavenly hosts, heavenly hosts include demons, praise God all of you, because Jesus is systematically plundering your stuff and 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 he's doing it through his ambassadors and so we sing as we live out his ways and uh, that's that's full dimensional worship we're singing as we're living out his way just it's really stupid to just sing and then live your own way that's when your worship becomes non-existent that's when the dimension of one of the dimensions of worship goes away and it stops to cease existing in a three-dimensional universe um so yeah I love Nick. He's brilliant. He's actually getting his PhD in like philosophies of sung worship, which is awesome. Can't wait to see what he, he has a book out on Amazon called um, An Informal Theology of Sung Worship. It's only like 36 pages and it's amazing. So get it. And uh, so I have a song uh, about unity. This is God's prayer. Uh, in Jesus for the church in John 17. This is my way of joining with him in this prayer. There's a lot of different churches represented here, I imagine. So this is it's just a, a cry for the soundtrack of what God is doing in unifying his church to show the world, what what is it? Like, Father, make them one so that the world will see that you sent me and that you love them like you love me. So Jesus hinges all of that mission on our union as a church. Um, and yet there are like, you know, 40,000 denominations in Protestantism, which is awesome. So we're still praying that God will make us one. Um. Shattered pieces, frayed and torn, a scattered people, a house divided, a love forlorn, a body. They'll know us by love, they'll know us by love What will become of us if all we want is blood Father, make us one, a new humanity Jesus, send your love, let division cease Spirit, grant us peace, blessed Trinity Make us one like you are barren wasteland burning cold we are a graveyard we are the darkness and your thousand stars the wrecking ball for our wounded walls 
You'll know us by our love You'll know us by our love What will become of us If all we want is blood Father, make us one A new humanity Jesus, send your love Let division cease Spirit, grant us peace Blessed Trinity Make us one Like you are Make us one a little volume on that. I got, I got too heavy for the sound man, I think. In my ear. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a prayer. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord yeah. sing it again you give life you are love you bring life to the darkness you give hope Restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we
to all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. So I wasn't necessarily planning on sharing this. It's so fresh. It's your breath in our lungs. Just breath. The Hebrew ruach, which is the wind, the breath. Breathe in and the, breathe into Adam, the breath of life. Ruach is also a biblical equivalent to spirit, which is pretty rad. But um, a week ago, yesterday, my wife and I touched down in a plane uh, in a, in a place we were called to play and lead worship for something. Of all places, it was actually Maui, which was nice. <laughs> but it was very hot. Very, very hot. Like the locals were freaking out. And we had a baby with us. We've never been to Hawaii, just us and an infant. And we were basically just trying to keep him from melting the entire, the entire couple's retreat that we were leading worship for. Um, but when we, when we touched down... Almost immediately, I don't, this doesn't always happen to me, this doesn't happen, but uh, I, I, re- I believe I received a literal vision, a word from the Lord. And this doesn't happen to me, it's not going to get weird right now, but <laughs> I'm charismatic but not weird. That's, a, that's my denomination, charismatic but not weird. Um, um, and it was like literal word, like, like 128 point Helvetica word. And the word was hurry. And it was, I, it was just, I felt the emotion of Yahweh, our Father. I felt his emotion. When he handed me that word, he was sh- handing me a word saying, as your dad, let me show you a word I don't like. Here. I don't like this word. So keep him, hurry, keep, keep hurry in your crosshairs and don't let him sneak up behind you anymore. Because I've been so ungodly busy with things great things so many great things but completely dehumanizingly busy um and all through that couples retreat i just i felt very compelled to share with the 53 couples from you know southern california that we were meeting out in maui i felt so compelled to share this with them over and over um Mako Fujimura is a famous painter who wrote a blog recently on extravagance and wastefulness. 
And he, in the blog, he comments on how long he simply sits and mixes his paints. He just sits and mixes his paints, and it's his livelihood, but he spends an inordinate amount of time just breathing in, breathing out, mixing, trying it out, scrapping it, reapplying, palleting, mixing. The amount of time on just that simple, menial movement. And by today's standards, that would in many cases be considered both extravagant and wasteful. And in this blog, he makes kind of a, an indictment against our Western culture, our hurried culture. And he says even maybe even mostly towards the church in the West, he makes this indictment, that we often utilitarianize everything. If what we're doing right now isn't useful, then it's wasteful and extravagant. Useful by utilitarian standards. Is, is what I'm doing, is this proper management of my time? Is this, am I squeezing every piece of this budget I own out of what it should be? Am I, what about my days? Am I, what am I doing right now? Oh, I'm just sitting and dra- daydreaming. It's wasteful. And that's our culture. We look at we look at stopping, listening, waiting, an hour of silence, an hour of watching a bird do its thing, an hour of breathing, a day. I know a guy who's planting tons of little house churches in Tacoma, and he takes one day a month to n- and, and closes his mouth and walks up like a public park for the entire day, the entire daylight day. And, if, and he's found if he doesn't do that, he is nowhere near as human as God designed him to be. And he has an hour of silence a week he takes as well. And so this blog by this painter is very, very enlightening. And I, I, for me, silence and listening is key to just hearing God. Like my generation, when I say mine, I'm at the old, really old end of the millennial generation. So anyone born 1980 is technically, I guess sociologists say you're a millennial. So I'm born at 81. And if, and if you're born, like, if you're 18 to 36 right now, then you, you consume more information than the past, like, three or four generations combined. But you're unable to read a stinking book. <laughs> That's just generally speaking, sociologists stereotypically speaking. But for me, I feel that pull. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm reading a book that I have to read for this thing. But it's been seven minutes since I've checked Twitter. <laughs> and it is dehumanizing, my friends. We need to fight it like tooth and nail. When Dallas Willard, famous Christian philosopher who just died, he was asked by some like really like productive church planting entrepreneur guy, he's like, what's the key to spiritual health? And Dallas Willard goes, relentlessly destroy hurry. He's like, okay, next. He's like, next one is relentlessly seek and destroy hurry. And he's like, all right, so are you going to keep saying that? He's like, so relentlessly seek and destroy hurry. And he's like, what? He's like, hurry is the most toxic agent that can come against spiritual health in this universe, according to Dallas Willard. And he's a pretty smart guy who made great ways for the kingdom, helping people understand the way of Jesus on a scholarly level, a deep thinker. Um, so for me, my prayer is for the mercy of God to grant me an awareness of my obsession and idolatry of busyness and hurry. And I think he's waking me up finally, like through painful soul ache, he's waking me up. So how, let me ask you, how, how often and how long do you spend in silence just Hearing from God. Scripture meditation, absolutely. I'm not talking about crazy Eastern meditation where you empty your mind. Hebrew meditation is contra to Eastern meditation. Eastern meditation is all about emptying your mind and detaching from responsibility and matter. Hebrew meditation is the opposite. It's filling your mind with the revelation of Yahweh. Just look at every psalm when he says Selah. Filling your mind with the filling your mind with the revelation of Yahweh. Filling with truth, not emptying, filling with to seek attachment to the world with God's mannerisms 
his gracious compassion. To reorient silently and then re-engage intentionally with his spirit, not your own, not, not culture's. So how often do we ebb and flow? Do we Sabbath and then dispense his shalom? I'm convinced you can't dispense his shalom without his Shabbat, without his Sabbath. And it's like this world is hell bent on destroying Sabbath, destroying human rest, dehumanizing people by causing you to thrive on seven minute sound bites 24 hours a day. Um, so that resonates with anybody. Like maybe I'm the least spiritual person in the room. Maybe I'm the most completely idolatrous of information and busyness in this room. And this is just for me. I'm just talking to myself, maybe. But if, if I'm not, if this is at all, at all resonating, then I'd like to, I'd like to invite you into a prayer for mercy. Um, this is a song that, uh, it's as simple as it gets. It's called Prayers of the People, and it draws from hundreds of years of, thousands of years of church sung worship. Ever since David prayed for mercy after being found out, and then ever since the church took on a, the Latin language and prayed, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Uh, that's what that means. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Um, so we can just let his mercy wash over us. Here's the verse. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. We sing that again. Let's call out to him. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. Like his children sing. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. could, if we stand to our feet and then just listen to the voice of the Spirit. He's here, He's present, He's in you, and you are in Him, and He desires communion, participation in the divine life is what He invites you into. So if you just listen to His voice, take a minute. He's not, we're not deists. We don't believe God is far off. He started the clock of the world spinning and then left us to kind of just figure out what he's saying. He speaks. He's present. So let's listen. Maybe if you're comfortable with it, what we encourage uh, our people in Portland to do is when we, when we listen, just to, just to posture ourselves, even physically, like palms up. Well, Lord, Lord, uh, take away anything that doesn't belong to me. I'm offering it and give anything you desire as far as wisdom or a word of knowledge or uh, a word fitly spoken, something. Give anything you desire and take anything you desire. I'm an open book. I'm a blank open book, really. Uh, write your truth on it and erase anything that doesn't belong. So if you're comfortable, palms up, outstretched, posture of just openness to the Lord, openness to Jesus. Uh, just listen. What would you say? What would you say, Holy Spirit?
How can we receive mercy and apply your mercy? How can we give your mercy to others? So why don't we pray, whatever we sense him speaking or doing, why don't we pray that over the person to our right? Just lay a hand on them. Don't even ask them what they need prayer for. Just pray obediently. Pray over them. The Lord would grant mercy. Reveal himself to them. However you feel led by him, he's present and he's speaking. With your hand on them, let's sing over them. They are our neighbor, quite literally. They are our neighbor. Pray mercy over them. Sing this over them. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Can we stretch out both hands on behalf of the city that you are called to serve? And if you are not on staff at a church, get that fact out of your head. That's a, that's a distraction. That's deceptive. That's a modern construct. You are a missionary to your city. The Holy Spirit has a driving mission for you to get behind him on and say amen to him every morning when you see that checker at the grocery store and intentionally bring the presence of Jesus to him or her. So stretch out your hands on behalf of your city, thinking of faces and neighbors and bosses that rub you wrong. And pray mercy over them. Pray mercy over them, and then that you might be the answer to that prayer. So, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Just over your loved ones um, that may or may not be in the room. Um, yeah. All of them, just your, the, whoever's around the Thanksgiving table, sing over them. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Let's fight that. Let's sing specifically. Lord, have mercy in this way on this person. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Trembles at his voice. 
us how great, how great. Oh, sing with me. So God, we've acknowledged you. May we acknowledge you from here on out in all our ways. Direct our paths. May we be more like you through your mysterious process of sanctification. How you make us more and more unlike the way we were born and more like the way you are. And um, We give ourselves to that process however we know how. Through obedience, through making every effort, through um, prayer, scripture, community, gathering, singing, all of the practices that you've made clear in your scriptures, we, we want to follow them not out of a weird kind of religious obligation to earn your favor, but out of a massive desire to be with you, to know you, and to see your kingdom come on earth. Um, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Thanks, Evan. That was sweet. Can we just give it up one more time? Dang. Thank you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> Classic. And what a timely word about hurrying, too. That was really sweet. If you guys like to support Evan and his ministry, you guys can go find his CD on iTunes um, and support him that way. Get these songs in your head and your heart. The last CD about, um, I forgot the, gosh, I'm totally blanking on the name because I'm looking at you in your pretty I'm face. For, I'm waiting for you to remember it. I can't remember it now. Yeah, I'm lost right now. Make Us One. Make Us One. Such a good record. I mean, get down on iTunes. It's so good. Um, before you guys head out, if you guys want to head out to the grill, um, there's some coffee, some snacks, 
And uh, there's a songwriter showcase happening um, right now after um, we get out of here. And that's just a time for some people who um, have signed up uh, to, to share some songs that the Lord's put on their heart. So go over there, enjoy some songs from some people here in the kind of central California area. And um, hope you, we can see you over there. Um, also want to let you guys know, well, I wanted to ask first, how many of you are here for the Restore Conference? Can you raise your hand real quick? Man, welcome. Man, awesome. So this was the first session tonight. Tomorrow morning, we're starting our second session at 8.30 a.m. with breakfast. So hope to see you there for that. Other than that, have a great night, you guys. It's so good to worship with you, and we'll see you tomorrow. God bless.